The Epic Life Ministry presents replays of sermons by the late Pastor Bob Hallman. It is our intention to equip the saints to boldly share the gospel of Jesus Christ by showing them how to love God, love others, and make disciples. We pray through these message replays, you will be equipped to share the good news and make disciples of all nations as Jesus instructed us to do. Please enjoy the message. Version from Matthew because over this last week or two, I've had so much feedback from all of you on this uh, teaching through Matthew, in particular chapter 18. And, uh, and I'll kind of exp explain why in a, in a couple of minutes, but um, there has been a number of people that have come to me and they've said, wow, I, I, I've been actually putting into practice what you've been teaching in terms of reconciling, and, and they're telling me stories of reconciliation in family, in friendships with neighbors that they've been struggling with for quite some time and didn't know quite what to do. And uh, I'm getting along the, the line of that questions about uh, some specifics about how do you actually do this. And so I want to address that today, but I want to tell you there was a gal that shared with my wife last week, and she said, I, I, I hope I, I didn't, you know, um, distract anyone, but she left while I was teaching during the service last week, and she said, I wanted to let you know why. She's telling my wife this story. I wanted to let you know why, because as he got partway through the message, I already knew what I needed to do. And so she basically ran out of the church to go reconcile with somebody uh, as a part of the response to the message. And, you know, I want to tell you, if all of you want to run out today right in the middle of my message, I won't be offended if that's what you're going for. Uh, but I, I want to say to you as a congregation and as friends and as brothers and sisters in Christ, it's such an encouragement to be fellowshipping in a body of believers that are so eager, so anxious, so willing, uh, so yielded to God that when you know the right thing to do, that you have a heart to do it. And even though it's difficult, and reconciling is very difficult, it's very challenging, and yet you have this heart to be reconciled not only with God vertically, but also with one another on the horizontal plane as well. And I want to tell you, it's just a, a very significant encouragement for me. It's inspiring. You move me and prompt me to want to, uh, to be that kind of a man myself and, uh, and do even more. And so I, I want to thank you for your modeling and your example. But let's, uh, let's take a look at Luke 17, which is a parallel passage to what we've been studying in the book of Matthew. And we're just going to look at the first four verses, and they emphasize many of the same things, but with a, a slightly different emphasis from the book of Luke, chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Father, we thank you for the incredible privilege it is for us to open your word and to have such clarity of instruction through your teaching on the kind of men and women that you are raising up in your kingdom, the kind of citizenry that you are wanting to develop and transform us into the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. And we want to say, Lord, just do the work in us, God. Our hearts are, are yes. Sometimes our flesh fails and, uh, and we lag behind, but God, our, our hearts are yes. And so I'm praying by your spirit that you would move us, as it talks about in Ezekiel, the last days you would pour out your spirit and you would move men and women to walk in your ways. And so God, I pray that your work in your spirit in us would be an agreement and that together with your power working in us by your spirit indwelling, that we would be changed and transformed and, and this incredible gift that you've given us in reconciliation with yourself through the person of Jesus would now be given away by us. Freely we have received, freely we give. Reconciled with you and reconciled with one another. Lead us in an understanding of what this really looks like and what it really means and how we can apply it to our lives this morning. And we want to say thank you in advance for bringing us here on this very day for this particular text with this particular group of people. And so we want to say in advance, God, the answer is yes. Move on our hearts and bring glory to your name and to your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in Matthew, in chapter 18, you may recall that uh, 
Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and he's teaching about the character and the marks of those that are citizens of his kingdom, of his new kingdom. And he says to, con to come into this kingdom, you, have to need, you really need childlike humility. There needs to be a childlike quality, not a childishness, but a childlike humility that's willing to reconcile with God. Those are the only people that get into the kingdom of heaven are people that are humble enough to acknowledge their sin, to confess their sin, and to repent of their sin and receive Jesus as Lord. Those are the only people that will be in the kingdom of heaven. And he says, that's what's necessary to enter into this relationship with me and into the kingdom. And then he says, this kingdom citizenry is so precious to God that he says, don't mess with my kids. And he's talking to the church. He's talking to the believers. And he's telling the believers, be very careful about how you treat each other. Do not scandalize one another. Don't stumble each other in your walk with God by your behavior, your conduct, your words, your actions. Don't do that. But he says, as he does in the text here, these things are going to happen. Offenses, scandalized, scandalizing will take place. That's what the Greek word is, to scandalize. And he says, these are going to take place, but he says, woe to the person through whom they come. But then in the next section of Matthew 18, he actually gives us a remedy when scandalous behavior takes place. And I'm not talking about terrible sin, although that's included, but I'm talking about anything that presents itself as a brokenness and a breach in the relationship with another believer and with other people that aren't even believers, but in particular within the body of Christ. And so he gives us a, a, a reconciling methodology in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. And then he wraps it up with a parable about the unmerciful servant. And we went over that last week. It's a powerful, powerful section of Scripture about how serious a thing it is to receive such grace from God ourselves, for us to acknowledge our sin, to confess it to God, to repent, and then to experience the benefits of his forgiveness and reconciliation, and then to turn to someone else who acknowledges their sin, confesses it, and repents, and we deny them those words, I forgive you. So that leads us to this text this morning, which is an expansion and an explanation of this concept of biblical forgiveness and reconciliation. Uh, it's inevitable that you are going to be hurt by Christians and even by your family and by people in the community. And it's inevitable also that you will hurt people in your family, in the church, in the community. And so God, understanding that, has actually given us a very clear template, a blueprint, if you will, of how we are to be reconciled with one another. In Hawaiian, we call it ho'opono pono. Pono means to make right. Ho'opono pono means to make a broken relationship right. And that's what we're talking about today. It, part of it is going to be a theology on it, and uh, uh, the last section is going to be some real clear practical nuts and bolts of what this looks like and how you can actually carry this out in your life. But let me begin by talking about the crisis of reconciliation. Uh, uh, Reconciliation is a crisis of sorts. It really represents uh, something dangerous and something very wonderful uh, with potential and hope. On the one hand, it's dangerous because it's so scary. And on the other hand, it's filled with opportunity and hope because it, it holds out for us the potential of a reconciled, renewed, restored relationship. And when the Bible talks about forgiveness, forgiveness is a procedural process. It's a step in the ultimate goal which is reconciliation. God isn't just interested in forgiving us our sin and having no relationship. He forgives us so that we can be restored to relationship, a reconciled relationship with himself. And when we forgive others their sins when they're repenting and we're working those things out, what we're aiming at is not just forgiveness, but we're aiming at a complete reconciliation with the person where the offense has taken place. So this... Recon reconciliatory process is, is quite frightening. And, I, and so I want to give you some obstacles, reasons why people don't do it. And the number one obstacle to reconciliation is fear. We're just scared of confrontation. That's the bottom line. I had a, one of the brothers last night uh, who's uh, uh, not lack lacking testosterone, let me put it that way, a very manly man. And, and, I, and when I finished the message last night, he came up to me. He's actually been putting it into practice and writing letters and communicating with friends. And he came up to me and said, this is scary stuff, you know? And he's talking about the fact that it's not easy to do this. So that's an obstacle. 
Another obstacle is disobedience, where we just, we know the right thing to do, but instead we gossip and we judge and we become bitter and we refuse to offer to others what God has offered to us. Another obstacle is indifference, where we're just kind of like, you know what, I just don't care about that person. I'm writing them off. I'm defriending them. They're out of my life. That's it. I'm done. And that kind of indifference is completely foreign to the Bible and foreign to the heart of God. God has actually got a, a, a heart for the victim and the perpetrator and his eternal kingdom and his reputation and the name of Christ is all wrapped up in the importance of this commission that we have to be reconciled with one another. And so indifference is not an option. The other thing that we do to kind of couch some of these things, like whether it's fear or indifference or disobedience, is what I call spiritual ease, where we say, I'm going to pray for him. I, I don't feel led to talk to that person and deal with it directly. And, and really what we're saying is that we're, we're finding verbiage to excuse what God actually tells us clearly to do and to not do it. We're just not going to do it. But instead of just saying, I'm not doing it, because, of course, as a Christian that's following Christ, we can't really say that to God. So we just say, I'm praying for them, you know, that someone else will address this when the problem is with us, with that individual. The last one is just, is what I say, just selfishness. Um, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit today, not much, but a little bit, because in our culture, there is a very twisted and uh, unscriptural view of forgiveness that the church in many ways has just adopted. And we've, we've come to the point where we think that forgiveness is really about us. It's not about the person. Don't worry about the other person. You need to forgive them because you need to be free from anxiety. You need to be free from bitterness. You need to be free from the churning in your stomach. You need to be free from the sleepless nights. So much of what is, is uh, taught as forgiveness and is explained in forgiveness in pop culture and pop psychology uh, really isn't, doesn't find its roots in the Bible. It's really about us. Nobody ever talks about setting the perpetrator free. Nobody ever talks about seeing the kingdom of God advance through this situation. Nobody's talking about how this could be an opportunity for evangelism and leading people to Christ. For the most part, it's just about us. And that kind of selfishness actually gets in the way. So if, if we're to approach the scriptures and God's model and the teaching biblically on not just forgiveness, but reconciliation, then we have to do what we have to do with everything with the whole Bible is we have to die to self. That's as simple as it gets. We have to be willing to lay our lives down for the greater good of the kingdom. But in the end, if we live this way, we're transformed and we become the men and women we really want to be. And so it's an exciting journey. It's dangerous. It's risky, but there's great opportunity. So I want to suggest to you as we go through this teaching this morning that uh, different people are going to come to mind in your mind that you have a, a breach of your fellowship with. There's a brokenness. It might be even on the way to church this morning. Uh, there was some offensive things that took place in the car or a conversation or in a rush to get out. It might be a, with a business partner. It might be with another person uh, even in this fellowship. It might be with somebody that you work for or that works for you. It could be any, any number of things, but things are going to come to mind and relationships are going to come to mind. And I want you to think of this as a dangerous opportunity. It's risky because there is the possibility of loss when you do things God's way. But there's also the possibility of great gain. And what's more important than the loss or the gain is the glory of God and the honoring of his great name. It's interesting that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes about this issue of reconciliation. And he says that now in Christ, in Christ, by God, in Christ, you have been reconciled by the finished work of Jesus. And Paul goes on in that chapter and he says, it's like verses 16 through 21, and he goes on and he says, now that you have been reconciled, in other words, now that you've been vertically made right with God, now I want you to go out as my ambassadors and I want you to have a, a horizontal reconciliation relationship with others. I want you to go out as my ambassadors and I want you to show people what I'm like with you and as you show them what I'm like with you, you're going to be able to do that with each other. And I'll tell you, it's evangelistic. 
It's powerful because you can even do this with unbelievers. Some of the benefits of reconciling is that you have a clean conscience or a clear conscience. Personal spiritual growth comes from this because you have to step up and to do difficult things. And whenever you do, in obedience to God's word, you grow. And then you're advancing the kingdom of God because you're learning skills, you're teaching skills, you're modeling the kingdom. And as I'll share with you uh, in this message, more often than not, uh, you'll be able to reconcile with people, but even more amazingly, you'll actually be able to practice this even with unbelievers with sensitivity in such a manner that they'll be so blown away that you'll actually have opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. And so a broken relationship can actually lead to a saving conversation, if you're willing. The motivation of reconciliation is very simple, obedience to God. He commands it, and he says, whoever loves me obeys my commands. That's all we need to hear. He says we must do this. It's not optional if we're citizens of the kingdom of God. The second reason we must reconcile is because of our love for others. The Bible says it's one of the great expressions of love is that we would be committed enough to one another, even under duress, that we are willing and committed to this process of being made right with one another when an offense has taken place. And that's why the Bible says, bear with each other, forgive whatever grievances you have against one another, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So we have a mandate from God to love God this way. We also have a mandate from God to love others this way, which comprises the greatest of the commandments, the great commandment, loving God and then loving others, and then for the restoration and unity of the body of Christ, which is his bride. These are the reasons and the motivations for reconciliation. Now, I want to talk about steps to reconciliation, and, and I want to preface the nuts and bolts of how to do it with some of the things that the world does and that we've actually participated in, I would say, in many respects, inadvertently, accidentally, un unknowingly. One of the things that we have been taught is to apologize. And so that's one of the first ways that the world reconciles. If they really get to the point where they realize they've done something wrong and they're willing to acknowledge it and admit it, confess it, uh, they'll, you know, they'll say something like, I, I apologize for that. Now, you, you might not think that verbiage is important, but it is. Um, the word apologia is actually a Greek word, which means to make a defense for oneself. That's where we get the word apologetics from in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in doctrine and theology. So apologetics means a person who, who uh, commits themselves to the study and the defense of the Scripture and the theology and doctrines of our faith. And so, but most of us, when we say, I apologize, we're not thinking of defending ourselves. We really mean, I'm sorry. And so we come to the person and says, I apologize. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the offender, and all of you are the person that got offended, okay, for just a minute. Don't, don't think terrible things that I did, uh, but just think of me having done some, th something that was offensive. I hurt your feelings, and it's, and it's significant enough that it, it's not really going away, and, and it's causing a problem in our relationship. And if I come to you and I recognize what it is, either you talk to me or I kind of, the Spirit speaks to me and I recognize that something's wrong, and I come to you and I say, I, I'm, you know, I'm just so sorry, I apologize for what I did. What do you say in response to that? Give me some answers. Okay, no worries, it's okay, I forgive you. All those answers are totally wrong. You're wrong. Every single one of you are wrong. No, you're actually right. It's the right response for really the wrong word. Because let me, let me go through some of these, and there's a lot of overlap. No worries, uh, uh, it's okay. Now, is it okay? Was what I did okay? No, it wasn't okay. Is it no worries? It was worrisome. It bothered you. It hurt your feelings. So all those things don't really fit. Okay, another answer I heard was, I forgive you. Did I ask for forgiveness? No, I didn't ask for forgiveness. So why are you forgiving me? Forgiveness is actually a, it's a judicial statement. In the Bible, when God forgives us, the Bible says it's, a, it's clearly not an emotional experience. It's a ju judicial event where God sees our confession and our repentance, and as a righteous judge, based on the finished work of Christ, sees our heart of repentance and says, I judicially release you from that sin. And by virtue of that, the Bible also says at that point, God also 
says, I cast your sin into the deepest part of the sea, never to be remembered, and as far as east is from west, never to be brought up again. It's a judicial event. So if I say I apologize, I'm stumbling through the process. I'm using the wrong word, really, because it lends itself to this awkward moment of I don't really know what to say to that. I didn't hear anybody say this. Maybe somebody did. But one of the things we might say is just don't ever do it again, right? And why are we saying that? Because we, there's, the, apology doesn't really solve the issue. It doesn't solve the problem. And I would suggest also another word that we use, a phrase, is I'm sorry. I'm sorry is not a biblical term. It, it represents regret, but it doesn't take the next step, which is repentance and asking for forgiveness. So both of those terms, although we use them, aren't really biblical and honestly aren't very effective. And they don't really resolve problems for most people, even though we're, our, our intentions are right. The other way that, uh, that people in the world try to um, experience reconciliation, although they're not really aiming at that, they're aiming at self, uh, uh, self-fulfillment in a sense because they're struggling with the impact uh, that, that's happened. So for instance, if I offended you, go back to the offense, and every one of you I offended, and you don't know the Bible, and, and, or you do and you don't want to do it, what you would do, and this is pop psychology and secular humanism, what you do is that you just have a little conversation with yourself to forgive me in your heart, but there's no interaction. The Bible doesn't know anything about that. The Bible doesn't speak of having a, a, a separate experience from the person. What the Bible says is that we need to have a meeting. We need to have a face-to-face. We need to have an encounter. We need to have a relationship where we're actually, uh, uh, you know, solving the issue at hand, whether it's with God or with one another. But in our culture, what we do is we separate it. And why do we separate it? Because we're afraid. It's scary. It's really tough to, to have an encounter and to work on a relationship that's broken like that. And so rather than doing it, we find other means to simply be free ourselves, but that methodology has, shows no concern for the behavior of that person. Do we care that they might be repetitive with someone else? Do we care about the fact that that might be hurting them, that they feel guilty about that? Do we care that that might be breaking their relationship with God? Do we care that that might actually be uh, damaging the body of Christ and other people that might be going through the same thing we're going through? Do we care about their development? Do we care about their, their growing relationship with Jesus Christ? The auto-forgiveness, I call it auto-forgiveness because you do it by yourself, only accomplishes one thing, and it doesn't do it well. It's just dealing with us. For those of you that have tried to forgive people that you need to have a, a reconciliation with, and you've tried and you've tried and you've tried, and you've forgiven and you've forgiven a thousand times and been convicted at sermons and messages and on the radio and everything else and reading your Bible, and you can't figure out what's wrong with you because you can't let it go. And I want to tell you because this process that the Bible teaches is different than this concept of, of doing this alone. The other methodology uh, that most of us frequently have tried in the past, if sometimes not now, is just time heals all wounds. We just figure if we wait long enough, maybe we won't be so upset anymore. But I know people that are 50 and 60 years old that are still upset about things that happened when they were kids. Still wounds that have never been healed, never been discussed, never been worked through. Still going to family functions, but still feeling that sense of hurt and anger, just little, little things go and little things happen. It's like it just, it, it, it breaks down grown men and women, even people who are grandparents, and turns them into just, uh, you know, just feeling like, man, I just feel like I'm five again. And there are all kinds of things that people have been through. Um, but I want to tell you that God's got a better way. And he reveals it in scripture. He reveals it in his personal modeling but he also preaches it and teaches it, and Jesus sh- shares it with us right in this passage, what we're to do. We're to go to the person. We're to present the offense. We're to uh, help them understand and see what it is. And they're, hopefully, if they're able to see it, and it's a genuine offense, they'll acknowledge it, confess it, and repent. And they'll ask for forgiveness. And when that happens, there's something very beautiful that occurs. So if, going back to my illustration of I'm the offender of everybody here, uh, <laughs> If I go to that illustration and I come to you and I say, I, gee, I apologize for that, and uh, I'm, real, I real feel, I'm sorry about that, then you're left with this very awkward moment of like, okay, you know. Um, the other option is I can just ignore it and not even know, or you may not, I might really not know, and you might be carrying an offense of something I've done that I, I have no idea it even occurred. I didn't even know that there's an offense. 
and yet you can carry it with you for months, for years. So what God gives us the opportunity to do is he says, no, I don't want you living that way. I actually want you to be reconciled with one another. I've got a pattern for you to do it. In fact, you are my, ba- my ambassadors of reconciliation, and I want you to model it. I want you to live it. I want you to experience it, and I want you to be like me with one another in bringing about this kind of reconciliation. So what's the pattern? Well, in uh, several places, uh, including the passage we're looking at in, in uh, Luke 17, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, forgive each other just as Christ in God forgave you. So just as in Christ you were forgiven by God, we're to forgive. We also see in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, forgive as the Lord forgave you. As the Lord forgave you, forgive others. Now this word in the Greek is hutos. Hutos means in the same manner or and or in the same measure. So in the same manner that Christ forgave us, And in the same measure that Christ forgave us, we're to forgive. Manner and measure, that's what the word hutos means in the Greek. So in the same manner and in the same measure that you were forgiven by God, we are to extend that forgiveness to one another for the purpose of reconciliation. So the question then becomes, what are the biblical conditions to be reconciled with God? Well, I think there are three primary ones. Uh, and there are probably more, but these are the, these are the stripped-down, simple, obvious ones. One is that for me to be reconciled with God, I'm an unbeliever, to be reconciled with God, I need to come to an awareness of my sin. I need to discover that, that God's, I'm an enemy of God, that I'm at enmity with Him, that there's a problem, that my sin has offended Him, and that that sin is going to bring a penalty and a punishment for eternity if I don't get that dealt with. So awareness is the first thing. The second thing is once I become aware of it, if I'm willing, I need to confess it. The word confession in the, in the New Testament Greek doesn't mean just to say it out loud. It means to be in agreement with God about my condition. I'm in agreement with God that I've offended him and there's a brokenness in our relationship. And the third thing I need to do is I need to repent. If you recall in our opening chapters of the book of Matthew, this is the message of John the Baptist. It was the message of, of Jesus, and it was the message of the disciples. Wherever they went, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for what? For our sins. Why? Because our sin has brought a brokenness in our relationship with God. And along with that repentance are these wonderful words, will you forgive me for my sin? What does God promise to do? If any man or any woman anywhere on the globe is willing to see their sin, confess it, and repent and ask for forgiveness, what will God do for that person? He'll forgive them. He'll forgive them. He promises that, doesn't he? In 1 John 1, 9, even for those of us that are believers, there's a promise written to us, post-conversion forgiveness, that if we come to him, and confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this isn't a saving reconciliation. This is a reconciliation of our relationship with God post-conversion where we've done something wrong that's violated that relationship and we come and we do the same thing. We acknowledge our sin. We have an awareness of it. We confess it to God. We repent of it, which means to turn away from it, and we ask his forgiveness. And the Bible says that God says that he is righteous and just in doing it because of Christ. And so it's an avenue that we have. And that's where in Micah and Psalm 103 that he says, I'm going to throw it in the deepest part of the ocean and as far as the east is from the west. He'll never bring it up again. That's the model that we have. Now, here's the question. And by the way, that's a judicial event. When God forgave you, he was saying that the, the mountain of violation, which, which was represented by the, by the servant in the last part of chapter 18 of Matthew, who was forgiven so much, billions of dollars, uh, of uh, trillions of dollars of debt, was forgiven judicially. The master had the authority and the power and the right to forgive that debt. And because of the finished work of Christ, we come and are reconciled to God, God's way, And when we submit ourselves and have an awareness of sin and confess and repent, God says, I forgive you. Judicially, he says, you are now free 
from the culpability and the responsibility for that mountain of sin. You will no longer be held accountable for that. You are forgiven. It is finished. So the question then becomes, does God forgive men and women who refuse to repent or to confess their sin? Is there ever going to be, I put it in a different way, will there be people in heaven who rejected salvation in Christ? Yes or no? Will there be people in heaven who believe in Jesus, they acknowledge his existence in their head, they know that he did exist, they know his claims, they read the Bible, but they refused to repent of their sin and they never confessed him as Lord and they were unwilling to soften their hearts and be humble. Will they be in the kingdom of heaven? No. Well, you're correct. Because, of course, if God allowed people into heaven who had not repented, who were not willing to reconcile with him, then many of the commands in scriptures that call us to repentance would be pointless. Because if a person could be in heaven without doing those things, then why were we told all along that we did need to do these things in order to be reconciled with God? We'd also have to reject the concept of salvation by faith alone in Christ, and we would be forced to embrace what's termed as universalism, which means at the end of the day, no matter what you believe, no matter what religion you are, no matter how you've lived, no matter what you think about Jesus, everyone will be saved. And that's actually teaching that's beginning to find its, its uh, footing within evangelical Christianity today. It's, uh, it's just stunning to me, but it's happening. We'd also be free from obligation to be reconciled with God and others because now the platform of how we are made right with God is completely removed. There, is, there are no rules about it anymore. That's if we believe that God uh, actually received people into his presence who rejected the gift of eternal life in Christ. So the, then the question becomes, what do you do when a sinning brother or sister refuses to repent when you're trying to work things out with them? I know some of you have tried, and, uh, and you've actually made a real good faith effort at trying to work things out, and the person is just like, drop dead. I don't agree with you. You're the problem. I, you know, I, write me off. I don't even want to be around you anymore. I mean, I'm even talking about a believer, uh, where there's just this breach, and you just see, sometimes it even happens at church, where people just like, we've had people that can't even come to church together here, because... Uh, the other person's here. It's like, what service do they go to? Uh, I think they go to the Saturday night. I'm coming to Sunday morning, you know? And I'm like, that's, that's, a, that's not a good solution uh, to a long-term problem uh, that God wants to resolve. And so um, we need to be willing to come to this and know what to do when someone's not repentant. And this is the real rub, is that we recognize that the model that we have of Jesus Christ is the model we're to follow, the manner and the measure. We know what the measure is. It's 70 times 7. He's told us that, right? So it's indefinite. We know the measure is indefinite. We know what the manner is because the manner is laid out by Jesus Christ and God the Father himself. There is a pathway. There's a protocol. There's a blueprint. And it's that there's an awareness, a confession, and a repentance that's involved. And when that happens, there's judicial authority to be able to release a person and say, I forgive you. And that's mandated because this is what Jesus told Peter. He said to the disciples, in this reconciliation process that's laid out in Matthew 18, 15 through 20, he said, where two or three gather in my name, I am there in the midst, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he's talking about giving the disciples and the leaders of the church the authority along with us to be a part of this reconciling work in setting each other free and caring enough about each other not to let a person go who's been sinful against us and just write them off. That's not the heart of God. He's placed us in here with accountability and with responsibility as the entire bride of Christ to take care of one another and to love each other enough even during those difficult times of brokenness in the relationship. Otherwise, how are we any different than unbelievers? Very powerful witnessing experience when you, when you actually practice this kind of a life. So what do we do when somebody doesn't respond when they don't repent? Well, we do exactly what God does. What does God do? What does Jesus do with those that hear the gospel? They've heard it through you. They've heard it through friends, but there's a, not an awareness, and there's, there's no confession of sin, and there's no repentance before God, and, and they're not asking for forgiveness. What does God do under those circumstances? Give me some help. 
intercede. Yeah, we know that, 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 that Jesus is interceding. The Spirit's interceding all the time. So he prays. What else does he do? Does he, is, he, is, is God in heaven all bitter and angry and upset? Is he having a little pity party? Is he talking with the psychologist about how, you know, he needs to deal with his inner turmoil over this, these people that treat him so badly and reject everything he's done? Is he, is he in psychotherapy? You know, is he, is he listening to, you know, peaceful music and listen, have to listen to the ocean sounds, you know, and, and get away and drink tea, you know, to make it go away? What is, is that God? No. So what is God doing? What's God's heart? Help me. I know it's a little... He's patient, and he keeps appealing. He's patient. You want to hear a great verse in Psalm 86.5? You, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all who call upon you. This is the heart of God. He's ready to forgive. But do you find anywhere in Scripture where God forgives unrepentant people? Is there anywhere in Scripture where God does that? There isn't one place. There's not one mention of anything like that. But God is patient not wanting anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to salvation and to a reconciled relationship with himself. But God does not pronounce that judicial event of forgiveness on anyone except those that are soft-hearted and forgiving. Now, a lot of people have, have mistakenly taken a couple of passages of Scripture and used them as a proof text for the fact that God forgives unrepentant people. Therefore, we should forgive unrepentant people. One of those passages is Luke 23, verse 34. This is where Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he's suffering, and there are like seven sayings of Jesus. And one of those is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And people say, look, all those people are right in the middle of crucifying him and insulting him and spitting on him and, and yelling at him and, and, and just being awful to him, right? Those aren't repentant people. And yet Jesus forgave them. Did Jesus forgive them? He did. Then why is he asking, why is he praying to the Father? He's praying, right? Does he say, I forgive you for you know not what you do? Or does he pray, Father, forgive them? What's interesting about that is that actually in the book of um, Matthew chapter 9, we have the story of the paralytic boy. And Jesus forgives the boy his sins. The Pharisees and Sadducees have a complete conniption. Why? Because only God can forgive sins. Only God has authority to judicially free a person from their sins. And Jesus frees this young boy from his sin and the culpability and responsibility for it. This boy is absolutely exonerated because of the finished work of Christ that he's looking forward to. And yet the Pharisees are so upset and tied in a knot over this thing that they say, no one can forgive God sins but God alone. And Jesus says, to show you that I have authority, in other words, he's saying, because I am God, I'm going to show you I have authority to forgive his sins, take up your pallet and walk. The boy gets up, takes up his pallet and walks away. And everybody's absolutely stunned. You know why Jesus went to the cross? He claimed to be God. You know one of his primary uh, means of claiming to be God was his pronouncement of forgiveness of sins over people. Jesus had authority to directly forgive sins. He didn't need to pray to the Father. He forgave sins directly. So what's happening in Luke 23? I want to suggest to you that Jesus is praying for the repentance, for the awareness and the confession and the repentance of these people to come to a saving faith in him, which hasn't yet happened. And so he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Were these people saved? Yes or no? Yes, they were. Sorry, I don't mean to make you, I'm not trying to twist you up in knots here. But it's important. Were they saved? Yes, they were. But not on the day that Jesus prayed. Fifty days later, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches the first message on the day of the birth of the church. And it says that all the people were there that crucified Christ. It says that all the people that, that threw him on the cross were there, the people that mocked him and scorned him, and they came on the day of Pentecost as the, the, the Holy Spirit dropped on everybody and people were speaking in tongues and people were astonished and they all gathered to hear what this might mean. And Peter preached the gospel and he preached at him and he said, you hung him on the cross. You killed the author of life. And they were just blown away. And they were convicted of their sin at that moment and, and their heart was opened. And they cried out to Peter, what should we do? 
And Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And the Bible tells us that 3,000 people that day were saved. A few days later, another 5,000 were saved. It was explosive. And it was the people that had hung Jesus on the cross, the people that Jesus himself had prayed for on the cross. He didn't bequeath them with forgiveness on that day because they weren't repentant. But on the day that they were repentant, which he prayed for from the cross to the Father, that they would be repentant, they repented of their sin and they became a part of the family of God. We have other passages like the Lord's Prayer where people look at that and say, if we don't forgive our sins, neither will your Father forgive you. But it's taken out of the larger context of Scripture where we have all this teaching. Uh, We have summary passages where he says, yeah, if you don't forgive people, God's not going to forgive you. And so people have taken that and run with that teaching and, and taught that, uh, that we've got to just forgive people no matter what. And we, we don't have to have a conversation with them. We don't have to be reconciled. We don't have to work things out. You just forgive them. And we're all tied in knots over that because we're having trouble doing it because it's not a biblical process. Now, having said that, I want to I talk about some rules of thumb about, uh, about how to be reconciled. Number one rule of thumb is if you can genuinely let something go, let it go. Man, the Bible is right. There are offenses all the time. Everyone gets offended. I mean, I get, you know, we drive, if you just drive around or if you walk around or if you're standing in a line, there's like a jillion times a day you can get offended. You can get offended because a tourist, you know, uh, you tourists, we love you guys, but you drive like California and we don't drive that way. Uh, so as a Christian tourist, uh, let people in. You know, don't bump the bumper in front of you trying to keep some poor guy trying to get into the lane. That's not aloha, okay? Uh, but we get, we get, people get offended about these things. We get all, you know, and somebody doesn't invite us to a party and we're like, oh, you know, it's like a, I invited them to my party and they didn't reciprocate. Phew, that's it. I'm defending them, you know, off Facebook. That's it. Uh, you know, we, we find ourselves so offended. If you're a Christian, though, one of the marks of a growing, maturing Christian is that you begin to be offended less and less and less and less because of your knowledge about how offensive you've been to God and how gracious he's been to you. Have you asked for forgiveness for everything you've ever done wrong? Of course not. God's God's been gracious. The things that have bothered him that are significant, he will not let go in your heart. And by his spirit, he keeps reminding you to get that taken care of. And all the rest of it, God, just as an act of love, has just overlooked it. You know, and it's been covered by the blood of Christ But there are certain things that that you can't overlook. But the ones that can be overlooked, we should overlook. The Bible is really clear. Love covers over a multitude of sins. He who covers over an offense promotes love. These are things that the Bible says a lot. So it's really important that we don't leave the service and you're like, okay, I I need to talk with you because you just, I I was leaving my parking space and you you, you cut me off going out of church. And, and now you're stopped over at the entryway blocking traffic because you have to have a sit down, you know? I mean, we're, we're talking about not living that way. We're talking about having a methodology that's based on Scripture and the Bible that allows us to be not just at peace in our hearts, but actually reconciled and advancing the cause of Christ in ourselves and the person that we're having a problem with. We might be the perpetrator, we might be the victim, but either way, at the end of the day, God's purpose and plan is restoration for everyone. Everyone moving closer to God, everyone being at peace and at unity together. This is God's form and God's version of reconciliation. But repeatedly in Scripture, we're told, don't get bent out of shape over everything. That's my translation. But don't, don't get bent on everything. You know, let some stuff go. Recognize that people have bad days. Things that you have no idea that they're going through are pressing in on them and they're just, they're like at their wit's end and you come along right at that moment and you you say something or do something and they don't respond well. I've just learned over time to give people a lot of grace and a lot of room to say things to me or to do things to me and I'm just like, you know what, I'm just that, that's just nothing, you know. I'm not saying the person isn't important, I'm saying, I, I'm overlooking it because it's just not, I'm sure they didn't even mean anything. That's how I think now. It's like people do things to me. It's like, I, they don't mean it. You know, even when it's pretty clear they do. I'm just like, <laughs> they, they don't mean it. It's, I, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna wrestle over that. I love the person too much and I just keep loving him and encouraging him and, and being a friend to them. And oftentimes I've seen things even out just by being loving and, and not, you know, having to go after everything. But there are those things that, that we can't seem to let love cover. 
That's not an indictment against us, by the way, if love does, doesn't cover it. What it means is that God is putting us in a position to be a part of his eternal, magnificent work to bring about reconciliation. And it's not just for us. It's for the other person. And it's not just for the other person. It's for the church. And it's not just for the church. It's for the kingdom of God. And it's not just for the kingdom of God. It's for the name of our Savior. And so God has entrusted us with this incredible, dangerous opportunity to be a part of reconciling. And so he lays out in Scripture what we're to do if we're the person that's the offender. Matthew 5 tells us what to do. If you know that you're, uh, you've offended someone, someone's either said something or you can tell there's a, a brokenness in the relationship, Jesus says in Matthew 5, don't even come and worship me. Don't come and bring your offering. In fact, if you're coming to bring your offering and you become aware of something where there's a brokenness in relationship, leave right away Leave your offering there and don't walk, run and get it resolved and then come back and offer your offering. The idea is you're doing it right away because you're, you know, you're leaving. It's like leaving your purse on the stage and saying, I'm coming right back. Not the guys, the women. <laughs> you're leaving your surfboard. Uh, so you leave something of value on the, on the, uh, on, on the altar here and then, you, and then you run and come back and then you worship God again. That's the mandate for the person that's offended. The person who has um, been offended is very clear, like Leviticus 19, 17 says, do not hate your brother in your heart. That's the bitterness that comes when we don't reconcile God's way. But instead, rebuke your brother or your neighbor frankly so that you will not share in his guilt. So we have an obligation to actually go and talk to that person and, and have a frank conversation to get that resolved. Matthew 18 tells us all about what we're to do. I won't re review that except to just say that the nuts and bolts of it is go directly privately to that person, tell them what the problem is, and if they respond and you have a reconciliation and they, they acknowledge and can see what the problem is and confess it and, and, um, and repent, then you forgive them. And in Jesus' name, you are making a judicial statement saying, I am releasing you, and now you're bound to not bring that issue up again. And that's a total blessing for the person that's repented. So it doesn't hound them. You've done this privately. If they don't respond, you take two or three others. If they don't respond, you take it to the church. If they don't respond, you then remove them from the fellowship. And we, I don't want to rehearse that because we talked about that. That's online. If you want to listen to those messages, they would probably be very helpful to you. So the first thing that, uh, that's really important in terms of a procedural um, protocol for getting these things worked out is your attitude. And I'm going to cover these very quickly. These are things that are really helpful when you have your frank conversation with your friend or your spouse or your kids or whatever it might be. You're going to sit down and you're going to do this, but these things are done in advance of that meeting so that you have the best opportunity for not just unloading on the person and giving them your two cents, but the best opportunity in a dangerous setting because anytime you're confronting people, it's dangerous in the sense that, you know, you might not get a good response or it's difficult for you, but it's a dangerous situation with this great opportunity on the other side of it. And so uh, attitude is very important. Examine your heart. And that's what, what the Bible says in, in Matthew 7 when people say don't judge uh, or you'll be judged. It's not talking about judicial, biblical judgment because the Bible, Paul says, we're supposed to judge people in the church judicially, fairly, kindly, for the reconciling of relationships, but we're not to judge unbelievers. That's what Paul says. And so we need to examine our hearts and make sure, are our hearts really right? Are we aiming at what God is aiming at, which is complete restoration and reconciliation? And so ma ma making sure that we've really got the right heart. The second thing is make sure your own sin is confessed. Don't leave outstanding things with God that, that you are in violation of while you're going to go and try to talk to this other person about some small thing that they're dealing with when you've got some big thing in your life. So make sure you're, you're clear with God. And like Paul says, uh, having a clean conscience both before God and before man, making sure that you're not concealing your sin because those that do won't prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy from God, but also from others. So make sure you're clean before God and before others. And then pray for wisdom and insight. The Bible tells us in James that if you lack wisdom, ask. And, and we need wisdom. What's God's will for me in this situation? How can I handle this person in the best way that has the greatest potential 
for success in the endeavor of being reconciled. And then search the scriptures. What does God's word actually say about this problem? You want to make sure that when you come to a person, you're actually presenting a sin, something that is actually a violation of scripture that you're bringing. And you're not saying, you remind me of my dad, and I hate my dad, and I hate you. Uh, that's really a tough one to put on somebody. Um, so it's important that when you're actually in, in this process of reconciling, that you're actually bringing concrete, uh, solid, substantive sin that can be identified in Scripture and that you can bring to them with a, with a scriptural solution. The, the next thing is to pray for the person. Make sure you pray for them. Do you really love this person? Have you got God's heart toward the perpetrator? It's hard when, you're, when you've been violated to have a, a heart of care and concern for their future, for their destiny, for their walk with God. But that's how God feels about that person, no matter how bad their sin is. And so the Bible says that we should pray. I can tell you, if you pray for people, you can't hate, hate people you pray for unless you're praying hateful things. If you're praying the heart of God, you cannot remain hateful to people that you pray for on a consistent basis. So be a person of prayer. The next thing is be prepared to forgive. Be prepared to forgive. Again, going back to Psalm 86, for you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive. Some people have said to me, you know, this whole concept seems like you're, you're promoting bitterness and you're pr promoting some sort of a, a legalistic system. And I'm like, that's, a, that's the farthest thing from the truth. What we're doing is we're saying we're already ready to forgive. Our hearts are already there. But as ambassadors of the message of reconciliation, we understand that there is a manner and, and a measure in which we are to conduct ourselves so that this person is, is really reconciled and has the potential to be reconciled with God. And so we, we're not withholding anything. We're waiting for the person to respond just as God waits. So there's no bitterness. There's no anxiety. There's no anger. There's nothing like that because we've been forgiven so much. We're completely ready to forgive. It's like we're anxious. It's like, I want to forgive you. I want to have this completely reconciled. I want this to be worked out. Oh, please, I'm appealing to you. Can we meet? Can we, can we discuss this? Can we find an avenue? Can we share? Can we pray together? That's the heart of God. The approach is important too, being um, careful with the timing and location. You know, don't do this, you know, in a crowded place with kids screaming and the TV on. You know, make an appointment. Uh, be in a quiet place where you won't be interrupted. Pray together with the person briefly. Approach the person with humility. Assume the best about them. Affirm the good in that person. I always make it a point to, to tell the person how important they are to me and why I, what I appreciate about them and what I love about them. Um, that really helps so that they realize there's a commitment that I have there. Uh, I'm, not just, I'm not just coming with a word of rebuke. Don't make accusations, but seek to understand their perspective and ask questions. I've, I've, I've learned uh, early on, I've made some terrible mistakes in thinking I knew all the information. But the Bible says the first to present their case seems right till another steps forward. And before that person steps forward, if I come to conclusions and then sit down and say, hey, I don't know how you could do this and that and this and that, and what, what are you thinking? And the person says, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't do any of those things. And, uh, and that's happened to me before. And it's just completely humiliating, shaming, and bad on me for ever doing that. So come in real humbly, even though you think you know what happened or what their motive might be, Assume that you don't know all the information and come in with a humble uh, heart to learn and find out. And then freely share your own failings. I, I um, not infrequently will tell people, especially when they get to the point where they're acknowledging the sin, and I'll share my own failings in some of, maybe some of the same areas. We're on the same field. We're playing the same game. We have the same problems and the same challenges sometimes. And when somebody's humbling out, it helps a lot to be humble ourselves. Share honestly and openly and accurately about these things. Be prepared with specific illustrations of the behavior or the conduct or the action because sometimes people are just like, I don't know what you're talking about. When did I do that? Well, when you did this. I, I don't remember doing that. Well, I've got a couple of examples, uh, you know, that might be helpful. Don't give them 50. Don't bring in the paper out and go like that and have it all fall on the floor. You know, give them one or two that are kind of illustrative of the problem so that you can give some understanding to them of what the problem is, and then be sure to listen. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, and then be prepared for initial rejection. It's very hard to be corrected. It's hard to correct. It's very hard to be corrected. 
And I've had a couple of times, maybe a handful of times in, in 35 years of ministry where I've had people grab me right on the spot, hug me and say, I am so thankful that you confronted me on this significant sin. And I'm just like, wow. And they're like, what do I need to do? I'm ready. Let's go take care of this. Can you help me? Just tell me what I need to do. I'm so convicted. I'm so glad you talked to me. 90% of the people that I've had conversations like that with don't respond that way. And some of them need some time. And I often tell people, you know, if you need a, a, a few days to think about this, why don't, we, why don't you call me or text me or email me uh, and we can get together again and talk about it. Think about it for a week and pray. Um, you know, it's, I'm just bringing to you to, to your attention uh, something that's, that's caused a problem either with me or someone else. And so I'm coming and I'm appealing to you, but I know it's not easy to hear. <clears throat> and so I've been prepared for initial rejection. I will also say that I have had times where it's taken decades for someone to come around. And I've, I've shared those stories with you before, but I've had pastors, I've had leaders, I've had people that have been in sexual immorality and fraud and everything else within the ministry that have actually decades later come back and, and repented and, uh, and made things right. And it's such a joyful experience. So don't ever give up on anybody. Don't ever write anyone off. As long as they're breathing and there's blood coursing through their veins, we need to remain hopeful and prayerful and appealing in loving ways toward people uh, that, uh, that we have a problem with or that there's some sort of a, a conflict with. Be self-controlled, uh, very important. Better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. If you lose your temper in the middle of a meeting where you're trying to correct somebody, that doesn't go very well uh, because now you're the one in sin. And then the last thing is demonstrate patience and commitment to the individual. Being confident of this, just as God says about them, that he who began a good work in you will also carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. We need to have that same heart toward one another. We need to take the long view. We're, we're a, a, this group of eclectic, different, unusual people with different backgrounds, and we, we're male and female, and we come from different socioeconomic experiences, and we come from different educational experiences and cultural experiences and, and, and different upbringings. I mean, we're, we couldn't be more different than we are. And in the midst of that, God says he wants us to experience unity. How do we do it? By being ambassadors of reconciliation. In the same manner and in the same measure that he's measured to you. In that manner and in that measure, go and do likewise. This Epic Life podcast, as well as all the Epic Life outreach platforms, are listener supported. Will you consider partnering with us through a special gift? Go to theepiclife.org to learn more and stay connected. Please consider inviting others to hear the good news. Be bold and live the epic life with Jesus.